who's by uh, Sushant uh, Sachendra, and he's going to be talking about uh, a very, very exciting uh, recent work on almost linear time max flow and apparently friends. And uh, Sushant is a, a professor in the University of Toronto, and uh, you know his, his areas is fast algorithms and optimization. And uh, he has been actually a, one of a fellow in our first program in 2013 in the Simons Institute. And I think you've been there, uh, you've been here also one program, That's right. uh, but already not as a fellow, as a... Yeah, I was a visitor and the, in the theory of deep learning. Program. In the theory of deep learning, and I'm extremely excited to hear about this result because this is really the breakthrough that we've had in, uh, in algorithms theory in the last uh, decade, big. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Please. You can hear me at the back? Great. Thank you, Shafi, for the kind words. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be here. And thanks to the organizers for putting together this wonderful event. So I'll take this opportunity to tell you about a recent work, giving first almost linear time algorithms for maximum flow and related problems. This is joint work with some amazing collaborators, Lee, who's in the audience here, Rasmus, Yang, Richard, and Max. Excellent. So maximum flow is a problem that needs little introduction to this audience uh, and beyond. But let's just, let me highlight a few things. We've been studying it for almost 70 years, almost as long as we've studied formal computation. Here's a citation from 1955, trying to capture the capacity of the Soviet railway network as a max flow problem. And we've been studying it intensely with good reason. It's a powerful algorithmic primitive. You can formulate lots of problems as instances of maximum flow, right? And that has meant that over the past few decades, it has become a test bed for us to develop new algorithmic ideas, new algorithmic perspectives, uh, and we'll see a taste of it today. So our setup is standard. You have a directed graph with M edges, N vertices, two special vertices, a source S and a sink T. Every edge has a non-negative capacity, UE. And for the purposes of this talk, I will assume it's an integer bounded between zero and a polynomial, uh, a polynomial in M. Let's say U, capital U is an upper bound on these capacities. So here I'm drawing an example graph where the numbers in black give you the capacities of these edges, right? And our goal is to send as much flow from the source S to, uh, to the sink T. Excellent. So we will take a linear algebraic perspective on flows rather than the combinatorial, you know, sums of paths. Let's take a linear algebraic perspective. What does that say? So for us, a flow is a vector assigning a real number to every edge. So in this example, now these numbers in purple assign flow values to every edge. What constraints should we should they satisfy? So obviously we want the flow value on the edge E to be non-negative. So it satisfies the direction and is bounded above by the capacity. But that's not all. It needs to be a flow. What does it mean? What does it mean? So to express that compactly, I'm going to change this graph slightly. Let me send an edge from the sink back to the source. And on this special edge, E sharp. I'm going to send five units of flow, which is the same as the total flow going from the source to the sink. Okay, so there's a special edge, you send the same amount of flow. Now something has happened. Now I can, now what does it mean to be a flow? It means that at every single vertex, my net flow is exactly zero. The inflow is equal to the outflow. And with these constraints, you exactly capture all feasible flows. Now I can formulate our goal just slightly differently. Send maximum amount of flow on this special edge E sharp while satisfying your constraints. And this gives us a, a linear programming formulation for maximum flow, right? You want over this space of all feasible flows that are identified by your direction and capacity constraints and net flow constraints, right? So net, we said at every vertex, you want inflow to be equal to outflow. That's a set of equalities, one for each vertex that can be captured 
via a system of linear equations. So that's your flow constraints, direction and capacity constraints. Subject to these constraints, you want to send the maximum amount of flow. Well, maximizing the flow on E sharp is the same as minimizing minus of E sharp. Why did I flip the sign? In order to achieve the minus, and I will show, show that to you at the next slide. So this is a, it's a standard linear program for maximum flow. This is the perspective we start from, and we give our main result, which is that in almost linear time, we can solve this linear program and hence solve maximum flow. But our framework actually goes much further. Uh, we can actually solve general convex flows in almost linear time. So what does that mean? So over the space of feasible flows, so flows that satisfy net flow constraints, directionality and capacity, you can now minimize any convex function that's representable as a sum of convex fun functions of flows of the edges, right? This, it, this, fr this framework now captures many, many more problems and we can essentially solve all of these problems in almost linear time. So for the first time, this gives us almost linear time algorithms for very many well-studied problems, bipartite matching, min cost flow, negative edge shortest path, diffusion, worker transport, optimal transport, matrix scaling, isotonic regression, weighted p norm flows, all of these problems can be captured in this framework and give you the first almost linear time algorithms. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I hope I will be able to give you a taste of how we got there. But to do that, I should first take a retrospective. So this is, I mean, a half an hour talk would not be enough to cover the, the history of this problem to do full justice, but I'm going to try to do it in one slide instead. So the purpose of this slide is to not just highlight some of the main developments, but to take a retrospective. And in that retrospective, I want to highlight the paradigm shifts that came along in thinking about maximum flow and then extend it over to several other algorithmic questions. So historically, the perspective that has been taken on maximum flow has usually been, was initially combinatorial. So starting from the work of Ford and Fulkerson, uh, coming up to Goldberg and Rao, uh, that these algorithms thought of flows combinatorially. And I want to say they thought, you should think of them as having a combinatorial inner algorithm and combinatorial outer algorithm. Okay, this is not standard terminology. Let me explain what I mean. So. I hope all of you have seen the augmenting paths algorithm. So the augmenting path algorithm says that construct a residual graph, find an augmenting path, send some flow and repeat. In this classic algorithm, I want to say the inner algorithm is find an augmenting path. And the outer algorithm says construct the residual graph and repeat, right? So I want to make this distinction of inner and outer algorithm. And you can actually think of all works on maximum flow in this outer inner structure. Like all of them have this outer inner structure. So all of these works up until Goldlewak and Rao essentially thought of them mostly combinatorially. The analysis of the outer algorithm was also combinatorial. And after, so after this bound of M to the 1.5 that they achieved, progress kind of stalled for a long time. 10 years later, Deitch and Spearman showed you could achieve the same bound. They didn't beat it but they showed you could achieve the same bound by taking a different approach by looking at interior point methods, which give you a new outer algorithm. So they chose interior point methods as an outer algorithm, which achieved root M iterations for the outer algorithm at the cost of a, a more complicated inner problem, in some sense, a numerical inner problem. So the, prob the inner problem now became minimizing L2 norm flows. Since then, since Deitch and Spielman, all progress on maximum flow has, has worked with interior point methods as the outer algorithm. And, they, and the inner problem has required linear time in all of these developments. There have been several. I, I can't even take the time to spell them out, but I will highlight the main ones here. And the big focus has been trying to improve the outer algorithm. Can we do IPMs with fewer and fewer iterations? But the inner, inner algorithm has stayed at 
linear time, every iteration. Over the past year, there have been a couple of works trying to improve the cost of this inner algorithm that has taken us hairline below 1.5. So the best result before our work was n to the 1.48 on sparse graphs. So in, in this perspective, here's where how our work sits. So we achieved the first almost linear time algorithm. We work in the interior point framework, but we work with an outer algorithm that now takes almost linear number of iterations, much more than previous works, right? Rather than root m. At this cost, the, the win is that we now achieve a lot more combinatorial in our problem, and that we can give an, a dynamic data structure to solve the sequence of inner, inner problems in almost constant time per problem. Okay, so I, in the rest of, rest of this talk, I hope to give you a couple of key ideas that go into, uh, go into our work. Excellent, so here's our first key idea. Our first key idea is a new outer algorithm, which we call an L1 interior point method. If you've not heard of interior point methods, don't worry, I will introduce everything here uh, that we need to know. So interior point methods are a general recipe to solve linear programs. So say I have a linear program identified by linear inequalities. Inside this polytope, your goal is to minimize a linear cost function. Right? Interior point methods give an approach to solve this. In particular, the first potential reduction in IPM by a Karmarker approached it as follows. Karmarker defined a potential on this polytope. This potential consists of two terms. You don't have to follow the math, but let me just interpret this for you. The first, the first term is a term that decreases sharply in the objective, in the direction of the objective. The second term is what is known as the log barrier term. The log barrier term keeps you away from the boundaries of the polytope, right? For every inequality, you add a term to keep you away from the boundaries of the polytope. Now, when you sum this up, you get a smooth potential defined in the interior of the polytope. I'm not sure if you can see this, but I've sort of drawn contours as to how the potential is decreasing. So this gives you a generic way of solving linear programs. So I will start from a point F0 that, that's somewhere in the interior of this polytope. I take a step to F1 while decreasing the potential, take another step F2 and so on. As you keep taking steps, it is guaranteed that once the potential becomes small enough, you are close to the optimum. And hence we can then just round to a vertex of the polytope, giving you the optimal solution, right? This is Karmarker's uh, potential. Like it's, it's a general recipe for IPMs, but how did Karmarker propose to solve this? So, so the main question I need to specify is that if you are currently at a point F, you have a flow F, how do you move to the next iterate F plus delta? Different recipes give you different IPMs. Here's how Karmarker proposed to take a step, said, take my potential function and write a second degree Taylor expansion. Okay, so you write, you expand out the terms locally. So you are at a point F, I will write a Taylor, Taylor expansion of the potential at F, that gives you three terms. The first is just constant, that's your potential at F. The second is a linear term given by the gradient of this potential function. And the third is the L2 norm, the, the, the quadratic term is L2 norm squared of L delta. What is this L here? Let's interpret. So, so, just, so G is the gradient of the potential, L is something I'm defining. Let me define it. So for every edge, let me define the symmetrized residual capacity. What is that? So I'm at, you currently have flow Fe on edge E. I can either remove Fe flow before I violate the directionality constraint, or I can add Ue minus Fe before I violate the capacity constraint, right? On the edge E, I have these two constraints. You take the smaller of the two. That's called symmetrized residual capacity. You take the inverse of the symmetrized residual capacity, that gives me length of the edges. 
right? So for every edge E, I'm defining the length as the inverse of the symmetrized residual capacity. And the second order Taylor expansion, the quadratic term looks like the length of the vector delta, the squared length of the vector, vector delta measured according to these lengths, right? This is a, it's a simple computation of a Taylor expansion. Now what's the recipe? The recipe is as follows that I will minimize this second degree upper bound over all circulations delta that I could add. So what is a circulation? A circulation is something that doesn't change the net flow. So the net flow of delta on every vertex is exactly zero. So this gives me the problem of electrical flows on, on graphs. Well studied, we won't go there, but it can be formulated as follows. Over all circulation, I give you a gradient G and lens L. Over all circulations, give me the one that minimizes the ratio of the gradient term divided by the L2 length of delta. This is the electrical flow work and, and with the celebrated work of uh, Dan Spielman and Shanghua, uh, you can do this in lo almost linear time, right? So, and a lot of works were based on taking this approach. Let's visualize what this is doing geometrically. So at the point F, I've drawn an ellipsoid given whose semi-axis are given by the length. In this ellipsoid, I have a direction given by the gradient G. I will find the point F plus delta that stays within the ellipsoid, but minimizes the linear function. And that's your next iterate. This is Karmarker's L2 IPM. Okay. All of this is classic, but so what did we introduce? We say, we are going to do this in L1. Instead of an L2 norm square term, focus on this, I'm going to upper bound this with a worse term, the L1 norm square, L1 norm squared of delta. So I'm measuring the length of the vector in L and add the square of the length. It's a worse upper bound. Geometrically, this means I'm going to fit an L1 ball inside the ellipsoid and I will move to the vertex of this L1 ball that minimizes the gradient. Okay, this gives me a different inner problem that we call min ratio cycles, where over the space of circulations, you are minimizing the ratio of the gradient term divided by the L1 length of the step, right? So, so we've gone from L2 to L1 and hence the name. So let me take just a minute to sort of interpret this problem for us. So min ratio cycle, you, I'm giving you a gradient and lens on edges and you want to find the circulation that minimizes the gradient term by the, by the length. A key advantage of moving to L1 is that now you can assume that the optimal solution is actually just a simple cycle on the graph. It no longer has to be a flow touching all edges. It's just a simple cycle on the graph. That's an advantage of going to L1. So as an example here, if I have a graph and let's say my lengths are in red, I also have gradients on the edges. So the numbers in black are the gradient terms on the edges. They come with a direction because the contribution of the gradient term depends on the direction you are tra traversing the edges. So, as a, so let's send one unit of flow along this cycle. The easy computation is what is its length? Well, its length is the red numbers, one, two, one, two, that's six. Let's compute the gradient contribution. Gradient contribution, you have to be careful. Focus on this edge in the center with a number four. The flow is opposite to the direction of the gradient. So my contribution is actually minus four rather than, right? So the sign of the contribution depends on whether you align with the gradient or you're going opposite to the gradient. Right, and then you can compute this. So if instead I reverse the direction of the flow, the length would remain the same, but the gradient would change sign. Right, so in this sense, this problem is partly undirected and partly directed. So edges and lengths are undirected. That means I can traverse any edge in either direction. You're not forced to traverse an edge only in the direction of Right? You can traverse an edge in both directions. However, the gradient has a direction. So the contribution to the gradient term now depends on which direction you're going to traverse it. Okay, so this is our inner problem. 
So let me now just state what is the guarantees of the outer algorithm that we achieve. So we give the following outer algorithm. So it's an L1 IPM for maximum flow that runs in almost linear number of iterations. At every iteration, you get an inner problem to solve. That's a min ratio cycle. These are not just arbitrary problems. You, you, for one, you don't need to solve them exactly. Right? You don't have to solve them exactly. If you solve them approximately, that's good enough, very crudely. So an almost uh, like M to the little of one approximation is good enough. These problems are changing slowly. My gradients and my lengths over the entire algorithm only change and like a total of, you only change coordinates total of almost linear number of times, right? So the gradients and the lengths are changing very slowly throughout the sequence. And finally, if I'm currently at solution F and there's a hidden F star that I want to get to, this direction actually tells you that my min ratio cycle has a good solution. Right, so this is guaranteeing that every problem you solve actually has a good solution given by the direction to the optimum. This is our key new outer algorithm. And this reduces our problem to now solving the, this inner problem, solve min ratio cycles approximately. Okay, and that's our inner algorithm. And this is a big chunk of the paper that I will not be able to tell you a lot about. But let me try to give you one vignette as to what goes into trying to solving this. So what I'm going to do is I want to motivate that because these are L1 problems, the experts here might identify, hey, can I think of trees? Can we try to solve them using trees? And I'm going to show you, yes. You can use lots of ideas from trees to try to solve these problems efficiently, okay? And I'm going to show you the idea by just showing you how do you solve a single instance? I want to solve a single instance of min ratio cycle. So I've given you a gradient. I've given you lengths to the edges. You want to solve, you want to give me an approximate solution to the min ratio cycle problem. Let me describe the algorithm to you in two lines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample a tree from what are known as low stretch spanning trees. These are very well studied objects uh, already in, in the context of algorithms, flows, uh, L2 flows. So there, there exists a distribution on trees from which you can sample on in linear time. Once you sample a tree, you check all the fundamental cycles of this tree. What is the fundamental cycle of a tree? You take the tree, you add a single off tree edge. If you add a single off tree edge, you get a unique cycle in the tree. That's a fundamental cycle. Check all the fundamental cycles and return the one with the best ratio. That's my algorithm. And you can do all of this in almost linear time. Okay, and now I'm going to show you that this actually returns a good approximate solution to the mean ratio cycle. Okay, so let me show you how. So the claim is that the best cycle is going to be a good approximate solution to this min ratio cycle problem. So let's say I'll, I'll do most of the proof visually. So let's say here's a graph. On this graph, I sample a low stretch spanning tree. I haven't told you what the guarantee is. Let me, I'll tell you in a second. Let's say the blue edges identify the tree. The guarantee of a low stretch spanning tree is that if you take an off tree edge, this thick black one here, then the fundamental cycle of this off tree edge is not much longer than the length of the edge itself. That's the guarantee of a low stretch spanning tree. It's not true for all edges, but it's true in expectation over this distribution, right? When you sample a tree, it's true in expectation. So here's how we'll go. Here's, suppose this green cycle, is our hidden unknown solution that's optimal to your min ratio problem. Then I'm going to sum up my guarantees of the low stretch tree over all the edges in this green cycle. So if I sum up over all, all these edges outside, those are off tree edges, 
and sum up the guarantees for the low stress tree, it says that the sum of these fundamental cycles corresponding to these edges is not much longer than the length of the cycle, right? This is true in expectation. So, well, linearity tells me it's, uh, I can pull the expectation outside and now I can apply Markov. So, with constant probability, I'm guaranteed that the sum of the length of the fundamental cycles is not much larger than the length of the optimal solution. I don't know the optimal solution, right? But it's not much larger. That's one. The second key observation is that now look at the gradient contributions of each of these cycles. So for each of these black edges, I have this red as the fundamental cycle. Look at, look at this blue edge, tree edge. Note that it gets canceled in one direction you are going out and in the other direction you are going in. So the sum over all your tree edges is going to cancel perfectly. So if you sum the gradient contributions, all you are left with is actually the gradient contribution of the optimal cycle. So what have we shown? If you look at this set of optimal cycles, the length is not much more. The sum of the gradients is the same. So by averaging, actually one of them must be a good solution, right? A good approximate solution. And well, this was constant probability, but you can boost it by sampling very many trees. Okay. So this shows you that by sampling one low stretch spanning tree, you can, you can solve this problem. That's of course not enough. You need to solve very many problems in almost linear time. That's something I'm not going to be able to tell you about, uh, but let me sort of state what do we show. So we show that we can maintain a data structure that maintains a few trees, right? Not one tree, but a small collection of trees that supports the following operations. One, you can change the gradients or lengths in a small amount of time, almost constant time per change, right? Because our problems are changing, we need to update these. Under these changes, you can return an approximate solution, right? And finally, once you find such a cycle, you can route flow along. That's our data structure for solving the inner pro the sequence of inner problems effectively. And now you put these two together to give our overall algorithm. Here's what the structure looks like. So I'm going to maintain this data structure that maintains a few trees. There's an outer loop of almost linear number of iterations. At each iteration, you get updates to your gradients and lengths. We use these updates to change our trees. With these trees, you find a circulation, an approximate solution to your min ratio cycle. You send flow along this, and now you repeat. Right? So, I mean, in some sense, at the end, it feels poetic that we've all come down to a sequence of trees and sending flows along cycles. Okay, so with that, let me summarize. So, you can now we gave a new outer algorithm, which is an L1 IPM. You combine that with a new data structure for solving this inner mean ratio cycle problems. And that can, the same recipe cannot just solve max flow, but very many convex flow problems in almost linear time. Uh, with that, I'd like to just thanks the Simon Institute for this opportunity and the numerous opportunities that they provide to our community and the wonderful service they've been doing. Uh, in particular, there was an entire program focused around uh, continuous methods for algorithms. And thank you again for inviting me here. Thanks. So the question was, how do you know when you're done? And one, one good way to see is we were measuring this potential function. So when, you, when the potential function is small enough, you know that the solution is guaranteed to be close to a vertex. And at that point, you can just round the flow edge by edge. Another question? Uh, yes, uh, so um, what happens if you use uh, L2 IPM? Ah, uh, good. Uh, 
that's that's a very good question so the 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 question is what happens if you were instead working with the l2 ipm so the first obstacle so many 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 algorithms were trying to continue working with the l2 ipm which is the standard approach the first observation is that you need to every solution to the inner problem has to touch all the edges you can't just get by with touching a very small fraction of the edges so your so your problems are dense and secondly when going from one problem to another the solution changes dramatically we do not know how to update the solutions effectively to be able to accumulate them right and that that was the approach the previous ones had been trying but only could shave like you know 0 0.02 in the exponent so n to the 1.48 rather than getting to almost linear i mean l2 ipms are actually strictly better they take a better approximation but the cost is you get an algorithm uh, like a sub problem that's more expensive to solve changes more rapidly right so what we're doing is we are doing a trade off we, we solve we take a worse ipm but now the sub problem is changing more slowly and we can we can we can get a handle over it rather than rather than the electrical flows so my question is it's randomized right i mean have you thought yes, about that the uh, algorithm is randomized uh, we we sort of have no uh, no idea how to de-randomize it. It's funny, I've actually told you the main place we don't know how to get rid of randomization. That's the Markov's inequality. That's the hardest place we don't know how to get rid of randomization. No. So max flow is such an important problem in practice that there are incredibly engineered softwares that can handle millions of edges per second on a computer. There's no way any implementation of this is going to get close. Might it be worth to take some of these ideas and work with trees instead? Yes, but I think we are very far from something that would work well. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you. So our next speaker is the last one before lunch is Professor Daniele